We're here to share with you inspiring stories that bring to life all the little and big ways that people bring more love, joy, laughter, and humanness to everyday life. Our focus is the hunt for those little moments that refuel the human soul and reminds us what life is really all about. I invite you to sit back, enjoy the moments, enjoy the stories, the adventures, and the journeys. Welcome back to another episode of What the World Needs More of. My name is Jarek Robbins. I am your host for this journey today. We are joined by special guest Olivia Jarris. Olivia, welcome. Hi. Hopefully I said your name properly again. <laughs> yes, you did. You did. Nailed it. Always excited when I pull <laughs> that off. It seems like a simple task, but I will tell you. <laughs> it is something I'm actually proud of every time when it works. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Our, our first question we'll dive straight into, which is what do you believe the world needs more of? All right. Well, I guess to answer your question, I really need to tell you a little bit about like what I do, right? So I, I've been super fortunate to lead or be at the head of this movement, which helps women become persuasive and really get what they want out of their careers and their lifestyle, and just generally speaking, negotiate raises, land their dream jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So what I think the world specifically needs more of is women understanding their worth and understanding how to advocate for that. Does that make sense? It does. And I'm a huge advocate for that. Yes. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I, I think... When it comes down to it, something that I've really discovered over the years is that oftentimes we kind of tell ourselves this story as women that we're not necessarily valued equally as men and that really perhaps that there, there should be a lot of government regulations and company regulations that really need to be put in place in order to mitigate this kind of situation. But... Too often, women don't necessarily own their responsibility in the equation because um, there's not much you can really do. Like if you don't know what you're worth and you don't know how to ask for it, ultimately, it doesn't matter how many regulations and transparency policies you have. Nobody's going to give you what you're not asking for. Does that make sense? It does. It really does. Yeah. I like it. So... Before we get to the next question, how do you bring this to life? I, I know what you do, but for everyone listening, how do you bring this to life every day? How do you spark this in other women? How do you, how do you continue this conversation, or how, how do you share with people how to actually do this? Um, so there's a couple of different threads through which it's obviously it's kind of always been it's been evolving for like probably five or six years at this point. And it started by me just basically realizing this, that there was this indeed this problem. It's like women telling ourselves that, you know, that it's somebody else's responsibility to give us what we deserve rather than us asking for it. And with all these incredible tools that we already have, but essentially at the core, um, well, let me, let, me, let me backtrack a little. So there's a couple of different avenues, right? There's like all sorts of services that we offer, but primarily we do this through a free private Facebook group. That's really, I'm sorry that you can't come in and join us, but it's limited for women. And in there, we help them troubleshoot their situations and kind of just serve them and give them back the power to say like, you know, there are tools out here that you already have just by virtue of being a female that guys don't necessarily have to advocate for themselves. So what does that mean is usually, you know, Derek, if you, if, if I have you think about someone who's a good negotiator, right. Or someone who's, who's at the top of their game career wise, 
what you're probably going to conjure up is an image of someone who's assertive, someone who's direct, uncompromising, and unwilling to settle for anything less than everything they deserve, which is cool. Um, and, and that's generally what everybody thinks of. But when you think about that, really, all those traits are intrinsically masculine. And when women think about advocating for themselves or negotiating for a raise or something along those lines, like our internal radar tells us that that's how we should act, that we should act like a good negotiator because that's the societal structure that we have that in order to advocate for ourselves. But what we don't realize is that we have these amazing tools just by virtue of being born a female, regardless of your gender affiliation, where it's really, you can, <laughs> the results that you can obtain by using those tools are like 10 times more powerful. And what am I talking about? Well, there's, women are just really good at building community, at building trust. And we're very good at nurturing and understanding where people are coming from emotionally. So I'm really not, I'm, I'm, it's funny because people will ask me like, are you a feminist? I'm like, no, I'm an absolute not feminist. I'm a realist. What I'm saying is that there's tools that women already have that are going completely untapped. So the avenues through which we help women understand this is primarily there is this free private Facebook group, but also through you know, our services, our email list, salarycoaching.com and such. But I think primarily like I've, I've found that if I just put myself in a position where I'm just serving these women and helping them show them what, what they already have, like it just, it has just kind of grown <laughs> to an, a huge movement in itself over the last few years. I love it. I very much love it. Cool. So question to get to know about you and more about what, who you are and, and that just for people who are curious, what would you consider mm -hmm. to be your wow factor? What makes you uniquely you and what are a couple moments that help shape it over the years? Oh man, I've, I've got a few, quite a few moments that shape that. Um, I think my wow factor, if you, if you will, is understanding that we all have a wow factor and understanding that I'm no better than anybody else, that the only difference between me and the women I serve is that I have access to some tools that they might not be aware of. So what does that mean? Well, I've been part of very like million dollar raise negotiations. I've helped women land their dream jobs at Google, Facebook, wherever you can think of really. And what I think the wow factor would be is that I know that every single one of those women and including myself, like we are made of the exact same thing. And there's no magic pill. It's just literally opening our eyes to these tools that we already have. Um, and I think a very formative experience, I don't really want to <laughs> make this a place, a tear jerking place, but like, you know how you, we all have those experiences that really shape who you become. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for me, a very big one was I had recently come out of college. I'd, I'd graduated from Tufts University, which is in, in a school in Boston. And I'd landed one of my first jobs and I was like excited, starry eyed to just give you some perspective. I'm, I'm 34 years old now. And uh, I was just super excited. I got this job. I was going to be setting, or I was setting salaries for high flying executives all over the world, helping craft their golden parachutes. Like I was super thrilled about this job and I was excited to be there and I could just envision myself growing old in that job. And, and man, and like, I loved it. And they loved me too. Like they sent me to get my MBA pretty much instantly. They, they saw career projection for me there. So it was exciting. I was happy. I was thrilled. And, um, and then one day, it wasn't my boss. Well, my boss called 75% of our team into the office. And uh, it struck me a little bit odd because my boss wasn't in the office. 
that they called us into. And my boss's boss wasn't there either. But there was this total stranger with white packets for every single one of us. And uh, at the point, at that point, I didn't really know what that meant. But I was like thinking, cool, they're going to give us an international assignment. We're, we're going to go set salaries in Dubai, something really cool. But it turns out it was our layoff packages. Um, and I don't know if you've ever been in a situation or any of your listeners have ever been in the situation where you like get your layoff package. But having to go back to your desk and pack your belongings and while all along while being escorted by a security guard and having to give in your badge is just one of the most humbling experiences that anyone really has to go through. And, you know, my husband at this point was deployed to Iraq. My dad had recently died. So it was like, uh, it felt like the lowest point in my life. But it actually wasn't. Things kind of got a little bit uh, worse from there. So this was in the midst of the recession. I don't know. Do you remember where you were in like 2008? I do. Uh, it, it, times weren't necessarily really good for everyone back then. You probably remember this, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, but anyhow, so I, I was applying for jobs. My husband at this point was deployed. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get myself back up. I'm going to apply to jobs. And I applied to 1,231 jobs. Wow. 1,231 jobs. That's like a lot of jobs. And <laughs> you want to know how many callbacks I got? How many? Five. Boy. And zero job offers. Zero. So I w it was just like, I, I didn't, like, I felt like every single one of those 1,231 rejections really were just like the workforce telling me, like, you suck. You're just, you're just no good at this. We don't want you in, to be part of the workforce. And... And like, this is kind of where it sort of hit rock bottom. I remember vividly being in the unemployment line. So when you're collecting un unemployment, or at least when it was back then, like you had to show up at 5.30 in the morning because otherwise like you would not get a check for the day. You had to show up really early. And even then it would be like an hour and a half wait before you got a chance to like show the clerk your, your, your work and the job applications that you've done. So that he could see if you know you, you could get a check that week, um, and I remember going up to the clerk. I'd applied to however many hundreds of jobs over the last two weeks. I had the proof of the applications, and I had my resume there. And um, he, he must have been having a really bad day, but he literally goes, looks at my jobs, looks at my resume, and goes, "Wow, I guess that." expensive East Coast education didn't really pay off, did it? Ooh. And that just broke me. Like that, like I didn't even make it out the building. I like fell down to my knees and I just started bawling. You know, like, have you ever felt like super dejected? Yeah. I, I, like, don't, I don't think I've had the moment you just described, but I certainly have. <laughs> but see, that's when one of those moments where you think that the whole world is completely like rejecting you and there's nothing like all I wanted to do was to have a job. I would have had the clerk's job. Like I didn't I wanted a job and even McDonald's had rejected me. So it was just I started I'm caught I'm crying. I'm like feeling supremely low. Like that was my lowest point. And then this woman who was behind me, she's probably like two places behind me. I'll never forget. She was dressed in orange. She had like an orange hair and like an orange bun, like decked out in orange. She comes and sits down right next to me, even though I'm hysterically like crying uncontrollably and puts her arms around me. And she says, "Hun, don't you worry. You're going to prove that clerk, clerk wrong. And you're going to show the world what you're really made out of. And I just, like, that was that little, like, moment, a tiny insight of clarity and empathy from a complete stranger was just, 
I don't, I don't, I don't even know if it was like divinely sent or not. Like, I'm not really a religious person, but like that moment shifted everything. Like it, it made me realize that if I can get one person to have a complete stranger to have faith in me and what I can bring to the table, like that is all I need to keep going. That's all I need in order to shift my story. And that's what I want to be for other people. And literally that's, it's kind of at the core of what we do at Salary Coaching, which is help them shift their story and understand that they do have power over their careers and their businesses and their lifestyle. So from that moment, essentially my story went from 1,231 rejections to now I've just found 1,231 uh, ways to make this not work. I haven't just nailed the right one. And what's crazy from that moment on, I decided, you know what, the, the world has been telling me to search for a job and to land a job this way, applying through job portals, using this resume, using these systems that are in place. And what I, um, what I came out of that saying, like, it's just the system's wrong. Like the process to land my dream job is wrong. And literally, like within a few months, I landed, I, I defined and landed my dream job in Washington, D.C. at the equivalent of the World Bank, doing this huge job setting salaries and uh, budgeting projects for like building small schools in Latin America. And it was just and it was all about that mind shift and really changing the story in my head. Does that make sense? It does. I love it. I very much love um, it. I, I could imagine these experiences prepared you to be able to not only get there yourself, which is incredible and awesome, good work, and, and also to, to help other lead other people there, which is important. I've met lots of people who try to lead people places they've never been. Um, I think that's silly. I think that's like signing up for a, a guide to take you through the Amazon jungle who's never set foot in the Amazon jungle. I, totally. I, I would not feel safe that they would be able to protect <laughs> me from the 27-foot anaconda that might be hunting me. Oh, and my they, gosh. And all the bugs, too. They've got all sorts of, like, deadly bugs. That's right. And, and it's one of those things, though. But if you, you know, I have a friend who, who just came here to Miami to visit me and his, him and his, his girlfriend, uh, they've been going to the Amazon for decades and I was like, I would trust them to take me into the Amazon. They've been there. They've lived there. They've, they've you know, been part of the local communities and tribes. They've taken tons of people on the journey. And it, it's properly prepared them to have the opportunity to take others. And I, I think, you know, you've done the same, it sounds like, in helping people. That's why I, I found you online. I saw your profile. And I was like, wow, this would be great to share with more people. Uh, and, and it's like, you, you. you've been through the Amazon. You've been through the jungle. You know what it takes. You've certainly gotten all kinds of, you know, funky insect, bu insect bikes, it sounds like, along the journey, which <laughs> sucks the first time. But, you know, now instead of taking someone through this journey and them having to lie down in a, uh, you know, a, a mound of red fire ants that are going to eat their skin all night, instead you could walk them straight to the side and say, no, 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 here's where you lay down <laughs> to make sure exactly. you wake up happy in the morning instead of exhausted you know, wishing you were making more and frustrated that it wasn't quite the job you wanted. So it, it, it's it, awesome exactly. that you've been able to yeah. put this together. You know, what's really funny is like, so I grew up in Chile, which is Latin America. In Brazil, it's, it's technically Latin America. It's really 50% of Latin America. But that the Amazon is literally like probably one of those places in the world that it's kind of like you're saying, like, unless I'm really, really well prepared to, to go there, like I just... It just scares the heck out of me. Yeah. Like, I don't, are you, are you thinking of going to the Amazon? My friend literally came here to Miami to invite me to go with him on an eight day journey through the Amazon. Oh, please do that and post your journey on Instagram. I cannot wait to see that. That would be so cool. Um, yeah, I, there's just, that's just one of those places where I'm like, I, I'd rather just see it in pictures. <laughs> It just sounds too scary. He, he was actually telling me a story. Um, he was taking a group of students down in the Amazon, college students, and they were on this mm -hmm. journey. And they first arrived. They came in at night because the the um, the Sky River had changed and the clouds backed up and their plane couldn't get into the landing strip. It opened That's up. Cool. They had a chance. They got in. It was later than imagined. They got in the canoe to go down the river to get to the, the to the hill uh, the, <laughs> the tribe they were going to stay with that night. 
And as they got into the river, um, they all have their headlamps on and stuff like that. And they noticed he looks over and he's like, wow, that tree looks really funny the way it's floating down the river. Oh, it's just no. A big old giant tree looking. Thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden the log started to lift up into the air. And he's like, wow, I've never seen a log tilt into the air like that. That's weird. There must be it must have gotten caught on something oh, on the ground. No. And as he tilts up and looks up the log, all of a sudden he sees a human sized head of a snake floating in the Uh, air and goes, Oh my gosh. Oh dear. And then the thing smashes into the water and disappears. Oh my gosh. And he was like, wow, that's the first time I've ever seen one that big. Oh my (laughs) gosh. Now what's funny. He is a wildlife photographer. He was thrilled. He was like, dang it. I didn't have my lens on properly to get the night picture of the snake in the air. That would have been incredible. The students, How are you going to sleep the students like were ready to get back on the plane and try to fly back home to Nebraska. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, well, I like, how do you go to sleep at night knowing that that's out there, out there waiting for you? And there's, have, if you go there, there's a really good book. I don't know if you um, are familiar. With, well, Teddy Roosevelt did this trip. Sorry, I've got my puppy here. She's scratching. Uh, he did this trip into the Amazon and he like kind of details all of those things and it's just scary, but sorry, I I cut you off. I think no problem. It's so it's that piece where, uh, the, the, the tribe that they stay with is a, a, you know, a a local tribe that's lived in the Amazon. They're generations and generations and generations deep. And so they go stay with them in their village. Um, these two people are are connected and, and ambassadors of the village. So they're allowed to bring small groups to stay in the village with them. And I asked him the same thing. I'm like, okay, you're staying in a village in the Amazon. Like, why does the snake not eat you? (laughs) That seems like a good place to go eat the buffet of people that show up every so often. (laughs) And he says, no, the villagers have a connection with nature and a connection with the animals and connection with the forest. And it's a respectful connection. Like the, the animals do not mess with the village and the village don't mess with the animals. They all support each other. And they said the beautiful ecosystem and it's a bond and trust that's been created, um, you know, for hundreds of years now. And, that's and, a really good question. I've always wondered that. Moment. I've always um, wondered about that. Yeah. And, like, and they have ancient rituals and traditions and things they do and how they take care of the animals and the animals respect and know that they're there. It's kind of like the same people who live in extreme climates and weather. Like there's got to be something beyond what we can see that's, that that it it's kind of that yeah what you're talking about that connection with nature yeah some unspoken bond of sorts one of my one of my friends i've become friends with him and his family uh his wife he he was like a, a crazy adventure seeker he had 16 guinness book world records always doing crazy oh my shit, gosh um under extreme cold and his <gasps> his wim hof the wim hof and his wife yes, i love him his wife took her life and it sent him into a spiral of depression and yes. he spent a lot of time out in nature and the time out in nature brought him back to life. And it was his that, connection with the cold and his connection with his body and his connection with nature that refueled his soul and remembered what it is to be fully alive. Yeah, I, I've heard his story and it is so empowering and inspiring in so many ways. Because like when it's something so uncontrollable, like he could not control that his wife took his life, or her life. Yep. And... What he's got, like, I, I, I'm still like the cold shower in the morning. I, I try it, but it's more like a couple of seconds. I can't really, I, I can't do the whole thing, but I would love to go to one of his workshops. Um, but do you do the cold punches? I do. And they're uh, wonderful. I get all my clients every morning? to do them every morning. Um, and, and that's the, that's the foundational piece to start with when activating high performance um, really? It, it is. I found it is because it's the one thing that can get a lot of the benefits that maybe four or five other things combined can get access to. And we can get it. Really? One, except for the other stuff takes a lot of effort. Like you've got to work out a certain way. You got to breathe a certain way. You got to meditate a certain way. You got to sleep a certain way. Where yeah. that one, all you have to do is stand it's there good. and breathe. <laughs> and get cold real quick. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. And what's funny is that... by like day 10 of doing it, it doesn't feel uh-huh. as cold anymore. And people think the water got warmer and really they just got stronger. Really? You just kind of grow some sort of immunity towards it? It's not necessarily an immunity. It's kind of, I mean, people will call Tolerance. it thick skin, but it, it, it's the ability where mentally you know what's happening. The other thing that's yeah. happened, my friend, Dr. 
Andrew at, at uh, Stanford Neuroscience. He mm-hmm. took Wim and hooked them up to all kinds of, you know, testing machines and, and body metrics and hormone panels and all kinds of stuff to measure what was going on. And what he, what he termed it is Wim is accessing a level of super performance, which is the equivalent of all the benefits of fight or flight without the negative consequence or side effects. Really? So the adrenal is fire. So the adrenaline rush? The adrenaline rush is what's hitting. Um, your, your eyes focus, your body burns, sh- you know, converts fat and sugar better, more properly and efficiently. Your muscles tighten all the things that would happen if you become the superhuman Hulk version of yourself in that moment. Uh, and it lasts for about four hours at a time. And so the other wow. thing that's happening in, and this is the, you know, positive drug addiction kind of concept is your body realizes the benefit it's about to get hit with. So the chemical cocktail it's about to get by hitting that cold Therefore, yeah. it's willing to be more tolerant of the cold because it knows it's going to get this huge hit of hit. <laughs> everything that's about to blast off on your nervous system. So your body actually gets addicted to the feeling and huh. it actually becomes like a runner's high where when you really? run every day for three years, the day you don't run, you feel like crap comparably because all the endorphins are lacking. And so it's that same thing that lands up happening with the, with the cold hit. That's, that's really, now, can I ask you a question based on what you were just saying as far as like the impact that it has simulating like fat burning and stuff. So do you complement that with some sort of nutrition? Like I know my husband and I do keto like lifestyle. We did paleo for many years, but then we found like going keto is really super helpful. Like do you, what, what kind of nutrition do you use to follow up that? That cold burst. Um, so I, I, I believe highly in customized nutrition. So I'm a mm-hmm. huge fan of getting your gut bacteria tested, getting your, mm. your DNA and, and genome and all that stuff tested and getting your blood work done. And the combination of your blood work, your DNA testing and swabs and all that jazz, and your, your gut bacteria will show you exactly what's the best fuel for your body based on how it is right now. And, and Wow. That's the best way. And that used to be something that billionaires and pro athletes had access to. Like, but nowadays everyone can get access because these tools are available for maybe a couple hundred bucks each. And it's an investment. It's a significant investment for most people. But, you know, you get to know exactly what fuel to put in the tank to get the optimum ROI and performance out of your body. And and so I'm a huge fan and proponent of that. Um, The other thing we talked about, you know, the fat burning is high quality sleep. They did a research study yeah. with two different groups. One group got less than seven hours of sleep or less than five hours. The other group got seven and a half to eight hours. They did the yeah. same diet, the same movement every day. And the other one, you know, the group with the quality sleep lost 30% more fat in the same 30 days. Wow. I, I like telling that to people and they're like, shit, it's so I true. Sleep, but that's I so my true. way there? He's like, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, that's funny. And this kind of ties back to like the, the inception story, if you will. So. Yeah. Another really shaping story, if you will, of like what I do today and who I am um, is so when my so I, I pregnancy is like I have two beautiful daughters. They're the light of my life. But I did not do well with pregnancies with each one of them. I gained 60 pounds and literally. So like my first daughter was born. I throughout the pregnancy, I like clocked in and like 220 pounds into the hospital. And uh, it took me an entire year to lose the weight. Literally, like on the day of her birthday, we were celebrating her birthday. I like finally I was back in my fighting weight and I dabbled in triathlon a little bit. But um, so I go <laughs> the week after my daughter's birthday, I go into the hospital or to the doctor to do like, you know, figure out birth control because like we had a five year plan. And uh, the doctor does their due diligence and their tests. And she's like, yeah, um, there's no point in putting you in birth control. You're pregnant again. So <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't. Like, I, I mean, I'm obviously, you're obviously happy. But I was like, oh, my gosh, I cannot. Like, I, I, I'm like paranoid of gaining the weight again. So I called my brother, who at this point in time, he's working and living in China, and he's my best friend. Uh, we just had this amazingly close relationship, and he kind of walks me off the ledge. He's like, listen, it doesn't matter. The minute this, this kid pops out, we're going to train for our, the race that we've always wanted to do together. It's that half Ironman in Pucón, Chile. 
Um, and we're going to trade for it. And, you know, these twists of fate just happen. He kind of calmed me down. I'm, like, excited about it. I'm like, all right, whatever happens is going to happen. But then we're going to train, and I'm going to lose it, and I'm going to regain shape. Well, two weeks later, I got a call from his girlfriend in China telling me, like, please tell me this is a joke. He grabbed his chest, stopped breathing, peed his pants, and collapsed. He's, he's not breathing. Please tell me he's done this before, and this is a joke. I'm like... Nicoletta, this is not a joke. I don't like he's never done this. Like, call an ambulance, go call someone, or, or do one on one respiration. You need to get air to the brain. And she's like, I don't know how. I'm like, just do what you think they do in the movies. You just need to pump oxygen in. She's like, it's not working, it's not working. And her friends there too, they're both in complete shock. Understandably so. And I'm like, tell your friend to go yell outside and ask for an ambulance or get help. She's like, we don't speak Mandarin. She's like, it doesn't matter. Someone's going to understand it's an emergency. Well, long story short, uh, 40 minutes later, the ambulance showed up and he was long gone. But what that ended up doing was I, um, you know, I, I kind of in my mind. So with the going back to the pregnancy side of things, I actually gained 65 pounds the second time around. But again, going back to the, the deciding that I get to shift and kind of craft my own story, I, uh, I started to train for that race to honor my brother. And uh, I started to train really hard. And I was like, I, I able to do and complete that race. But once I got there, I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to prove that I can go from 200 and whatever it was, 230 pounds to qualifying for Team USA. And I did. I qualified for Team USA's half Ironman triathlon team. Nice. Like, but it's that kind of stuff, like where your nutrition, and then I went, eventually, you know, I stopped training and I realized that my nutrition was all over the place. But you're right on the sleep too. Like, and now I wasn't being able to sleep that well. Um, because I wasn't training as much. It's crazy how you can condition your body to do something, and then when you shift it away from that, it doesn't change. Doesn't yeah, it yeah. changes quickly. Um, it's something I learned. With, I, I tend to work with a lot of small business owners, and so uh -huh. I, I've learned in helping them be the happiest, healthiest, strongest, and most fulfilled version of themselves. We focus awesome. specifically on sleep, nutrition, movement, mindfulness, happiness, uh, peer group. Um, all, all of these statements, that's amazing. You know, how well they're able to stay calm, calm and, and focused all day versus tense or, or hijacked. And so we, we track all these different things using all kinds of really cool technology. Um, and, and we're able to measure them constantly. Like I know how well they can clear their mind in the morning. I know their breath pattern all day, calm, tense or focused. Uh, and then wow. we take a self assessment. We know their heart rate variability and their, their sleep quality every night. And we start to look for patterns and identify when they're at their best and when they're not. Um, the only reason I, I pick small business owners is because they can instantly get a, a financial ROI out of it by being at their best. Because mm -hmm. when they're at their best, they control their business differently, which causes their revenue to go up or profit to go up, and then it justifies the, the payment for itself. Um, lots of other people could use it. It's just, you know, you know we created a, a small online course for 10 bucks for everybody else so they could still get all the tools. Um, oh, and, that's awesome. 10 bucks. It's like, yeah, take it. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, but then our clients, you know, they invest quite a bit to get access to all the, the us doing it for them kind of stuff. But to circle back to your amazingness, uh, I have a few more questions since we have a couple minutes here. Um, one, what has been an awe-inspiring moment? I, I took notes on a few of them you told me about so far. But I'll ask you, what would qualify as an awe-inspiring moment throughout your journey to, to you? I don't know that there's been like one really big awe inspiring moment but literally like the the kind of moments that nowadays brings me to my knees and like makes me so grateful for having the opportunity to serve women in the way that I do is when I get that message or I see the Facebook notice of like I landed that job or I negotiated that raise or I you know, like now I'm able to put food on the table because I went from being unemployed to having that job. So like seeing that 
at an individual level, I have helped someone going from their lowest to feeling that they are capable of themselves. Like, and they're, they're small moments, right? Like on the grand scheme of things, like it's not something that's happened to me, but it's something that I, like I helped, I served this woman in the right way. Like I was that, the equivalent of that woman in the orange outfit for her. And literally for me, it was so simple. All I had to do was show up and encourage her or give her one or two pieces of advice or tools. So I don't think that there's one big wow moment that has really cemented in me, uh, like, I don't know that, like, I don't know that that completely wows me. Like I live for these small moments and I wake up excited every single day thinking, all right, let's see how we can help these women today. I love that. I love it. What about your greatest fear? (sighs) I've got to say, man, that's a tricky one. What's your greatest fear? (laughs) Just to put it in perspective, can I ask that? Uh, sure. Um, right now, my greatest fear, I, I've grown up in an environment where it was all about facing your fears and walking through your fears and breaking through your fears. And so anytime I find a fear, I tend to just charge head first on fire straight into it. Like I was like, oh, I'm afraid to jump out of a plane. I'm like, I should jump out of a plane today. <laughs> And, and you're like, okay, um, that's gone not so great at some times in life where I've made some interesting oh, no. decisions. You know, I, I was like, wow, I'm kind of nervous of asking that girl out. I should ask her to marry me. And oh, you know, my gosh. that led to me getting out of church, jumping in the freeway, driving two and a half hours north to where this girl lived. Halfway there, I drove by a, a store and I'm like, fuck, if you're going to ask a girl to marry you, you might as well have a ring. So I pulled off the freeway, bought a ring for 10 minutes, jumped, you know, went to a Jared's or something like I'm like that'll do, paid for it, got in the car, <gasps> kept driving, showed up at her house, knocked on the front door. Luckily, she wasn't home. And, and uh, you know, oh I, I called goodness. her five times. She's like, what, are you OK? Is there an emergency? I was like, oh, no, I just had something to ask you. Like never went <gasps> on a date, never kissed, never knew each other in that way. We're just good friends. But I had an inkling of like maybe maybe we'd be great together and i don't know it kind of freaks me out so i should break through it and i was like wait a minute i need to slow down turbo on certain things so luckily (laughs) i turned that down a little in life um but but truly deeply the greatest fear i'd have right now is something anything happening to my wife um yeah i i live for her i love for her and and my number one mission and goal every day is making her feel like the or helping her not making but helping her feel like the happiest healthiest most amazing most beautiful most seen most understood and appreciated woman on earth yeah and to serve her right yeah. well done well done um i you know and i've got to i've got to say that fear just completely resonates with me like i think there's really nothing out there that i think i can't achieve or accomplish if I really like put my mind to it. And it's not because I have some sort of superhuman power. It's just because I realize that, you know what, if you really want it and there's obstacles in the way, it's probably because it's that much more valuable ultimately. Right. But I would have to say that my biggest fear completely resonates with yours. Like having gone through so much loss, if you will, like having lost my dad, my brother, several friends in Iraq, um, like grandparents and all that, I, anything happening to my family, like it just like that. Literally, my daughter. It's funny because we live in the woods in New Hampshire, in the middle of nowhere, and my daughter like loves walking our dog. So we've got three golden retrievers. Because if you can have one, why not have three? <laughs> and she likes to specifically walk one of them on a leash, and the other guys go just by themselves. And it was seven o'clock and you know it's starting to get darker a little bit later and later during the day and she's like wow mommy i'm gonna go walk zuma and uh just i'll be back in a couple minutes well it's 7 20 she left at seven she wasn't back yet and it's starting to get dark like dark dark and i'm like freaking out and that dark place of fear literally that you're mentioning it like came up i was like maya and i'm like yelling everywhere 
And it turns out she, she was literally like not even half a mile down. There's like this little creek, which now the snow is melting so she could kind of access it. And she was like drinking water off, off of the creek with the dog. I don't know. Whatever kids do, I was like, I don't know if that's toxic or not. I, probably not. But um, it was just that visceral, gut-wrenching fear that I was not going to see her again. That, ah, uh, I just, when you asked about the greatest fear, I'm like, it just completely bubbled back up. I'm like, that's one I definitely don't want to face. Do you know what I mean? I'm with you. We don't have kids yet, but I'd imagine no, but with my, your wife, my bubble right? will expand to them. And I definitely feel that <laughs> way about my wife. She does drink some interesting stuff that I'm like, what in the world? Um, yes. <laughs> oh, really? No, like what? I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> Kombucha. Probably. And like Kombucha, I still have not wrapped my head around. I understand the concept, but I'm like, fermented stuff, isn't that not good for the inside of your body? <laughs> Fermentation. How is that? I don't know. Like, I, I keep hearing that it's good for you. We go back and forth on certain things. Um, <laughs> but she also makes fun of the fact that I like drinking green drink. She, she understands it's healthy. She actually likes it. But she's like, really? It's like putting grass down your throat. And I'm like, yes, what it's do you good for you. What do you put in your green chicks? Um, it's just a powder. It's amazing grass, but it, like lemongrass stuff. It's a lemongrass sure. favorite, but it, it's wheat. It's like barley, alfalfa sprouts, broccoli sprouts. It, it's all this like super, super heavy green stuff mixed into a powder with actually pineapple lemongrass flavoring to it. So I, I think it's delicious. Um, but it's so good for your body and in keeping alkaline and healthy and offsetting all the excess, you know, acid you build up throughout the day. Um, Great you know, energy. I've been meaning, I've been meaning to explore the alkaline diet. I hope you post up more stuff about this, or if you sell these kind of products, I'm, l I'm looking for them. Yeah. Um, I'll get you a copy of our high performance course. It has lots of great information in it. And the expert we brought, I don't know if you've heard of Ben Greenfield. I love Ben Greenfield. Yeah. So yes. Ben is our health and fitness expert in the program. So he, he talks through, That's if, awesome. you, if you love him, you already know, his yeah. stuff, but he comes on and talks about um, he, he's heavy towards the keto type diet. Uh, nice, and, and yeah. he loves it. And then he talks about all the nutrition type stuff to watch for. And then he talks about the fitness stuff to watch for at a basic level for people of how to be, you know, lots of energy and lots of strength and endurance. That's yeah. I mean, like I, I, well, not, not that he recommended it, but like I kind of, when I went from team USA, I was like, all right, well, what do I do next? And then I picked up like CrossFit yeah. and started doing that kind of muscle workout that nobody really thinks about like that you really need to do to maintain yeah to be amazing. fit and to be healthy i have another friend you should probably look up she's awesome her name is siri lindley well um, of course i know siri she's a world champion triathlete yes she's one of my favorite people her and bet her wife uh, she yes she was actually gonna write the foreword for my book for oh. my next an upcoming book you guys are already besties uh, <laughs> but she is it's so true though she is she's an amazing story and athlete too yeah she's a badass um and, and you're right in that tribe then so you probably like all our stuff <laughs> yes i need to hear more about this <laughs> very Please. cool um very cool I'll, I'll send you some of it but to wrap up Thank the you. show for everyone listening all right. we got we got four more questions then we're all right let's what do are this. you most excited about for your future Oh man, making the difference in every single one, like growing the movement that I've just been so fortunate to, to, to be leading right now. Like I cannot wait, wait to make a difference in the lives of millions of women to like be that woman in the orange outfit that just essentially kind of says like, Hey, look, look up. There's an opening at the end of the tunnel. There's the light right there. Come on, let's go get it. I love that. Now, we're going to transition. This is the nuts and bolts section. This is the tactical, tangible, practical, immediately applicable type of advice from you to everyone who's listening, all you all right. people out there. The first question, and I think I know the answer, but I'm still going to ask it for everyone listening, which is where do you currently focus the majority of your thoughts and time and life each day <laughs> as of right now? In helping women figure out their worth and how to actually advocate for it Very so cool. women who are either so I, I think I, I would say like specifically it's women in the workforce I like 
helping them understand. And I, and this might be, and, and it's not really polarizing, but like it's the whole concept of inequality, right? That we keep hearing, and it's such a popular topic to talk about inequality and gender inequality, and that we want to reach equality one day. But that, like if you just think about that concept, broadly speaking, that presumes that we are lesser than in one way or another I'm, and that's where i'm like that's not true yeah i'm a huge fan of equality and i i, I think just in my own personal opinion i'm gonna throw it in here for 10 seconds just for whatever right. it's worth. hopefully it's useful um, bring it i believe equality is an evolution of thought that's on a different scale of consciousness than inequality um which means we have yeah. to evolve to it and realize that we're all humans yeah and we're all humans and, mm -hmm. and if you're going to subscribe to there's differences between us, then you're describing the fact that we're different and, and then there's inequality and equality and better and worse to either side. If you're subscribing to the fact that we're equal as human. Now, now yes. I realize our body forms may be different, but so are men's. There's small men and big men. There's tall men and short men. There's fast men and slow men. There's strong men mm -hmm. and weak men. Like So is women. There's tall yeah. women and short women and strong women and weak women and, and fat women and slim women and powerful women and not powerful women and everything. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of humans. And if they're right. all considered human, now we can say, okay, whatever we're going to do has to be cool for all humans. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And that, that's yes. a new structure of thought. Yes. That yes. I'm cool with. Um, but the see, tricky you're part spot is on. when people dance between, that's what I want, except for I still want to adhere to all the benefits of the, the uh, old paradigm. The, that's right. the dancing ground where I kind of shake my head and I say, that's okay. That's part of a transition. You hold on to both sides as hard as you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, but at some point, you know, I hope everyone takes the leap to be like, we're humans. And every human, right. you know, they, I love finding articles where I go back in history and when they pop up, I share the hell out of them, uh, which is articles where things that one time in history, so during the World War, when it, you know, mm. men did X and women did Y kind of stuff. And then it's like the group, I think they were Russian. Uh, they were, they were called the, the night witches. And it was an uh -huh. all female group of pilots who used to rain hell on, on the Germans at night by dropping artillery that's from the sky. Awesome. And I was like, yes, that's amazing. <laughs> they could do it too. Uh, when we were in one, one more, we were visiting India. I took my wife to go see the, the Taj Mahal for our anniversary for fun. Wow. And we went for a weekend. And while we were there, a friend of ours took us to a Sikh, uh, I think it was a Sikh temple, certain tradition. Yeah. And they were the defenders of, of, of India at one point. Like they, they believed in force and power. And one of my one of the most beautiful pictures I saw was as we went through all the different leaders of the of the groups at different times. There was one yeah. with this badass woman on a horse with a big ass sword leading the army in the battle. I was like, yeah, look That's at that. Awesome. Like there's a and there's an army of men and women behind her. And I'm, I'm not advocating the fighting or the war, but I'm saying, hey. In these things that traditionally people would say, oh, oh, men do that. The women stay home and take care of the kids and the men go fight for peace or equality or whatever it is they're fighting for. It's like, nah, bullshit. Look at history. Like, there were some amazing humans exactly. who led from all, all moments. Um, yeah, well, I think you're spot on. I mean, you're absolutely spot on. Like, taking the stance of there is such a thing as inequality is... And, and this is kind of where, where it comes in into like when some people talk to us at salary coaching at first, they're like, oh, well, this, like, I don't know, like you're making an extreme stance about women. I'm like, no, no, no. Like I get it that there's government changes happening and that companies need to be transparent. But the reality is like if you're showing up thinking that you're unequal to a guy, you will be unequal to a guy. Correct. If you start from the, the frame or like the, the, the concept that – there is such a way for you to be unequal in lesser than a guy. Yep. Well, absolutely. You're going to be lesser than. That's right. So, I'm, yeah. I'm I mean, if you show up to a race, it doesn't matter if it's a man, woman, or anything in, else standing on the starting line. Like, you better hope you could win. And you better know you could win with certainty if you exactly. have a chance of winning. Exactly. Um, and, and so I, I was also raised by many women in our family for the most part. 
And so I grew up all around him and, and I've watched him. I, you know, the, the moment my stepbrother had two girls, he became, he became a feminist. He's like, I was like, wow, <laughs> like, this man fights for those things. I'm like, I, I do too. My nieces, I want them to have every opportunity in the world. And there's no reason they shouldn't. Um, I, I, I just believe there, there's that next level of, of evolution of thought, which is, oh, we're all humans. Now, all of us have totally. certain characteristics. It's, it's what ended apartheid in South Africa, because at one point it was a black or white problem. Either you're white right. or you're black, and that's the problem. And someone said, right. wait a minute. You know, that black police officer is nothing like that black lawyer or that black janitor. And that white janitor is nothing like that white lawyer or that white police officer. But the right. police officers are alike, and the lawyers are alike, and the janitors are alike. And they went, ah, right. maybe it has nothing to do with profession. Or I'm sorry, nothing to do with skin color, but everything to do with the way of consciousness. They created spiral exactly. dynamics, which showed there's a whole different level of thinking process through each group of people. And it's like, oh, it's not black or white. There's a whole rainbow of colors, and it, it's all human. And it didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. You it's all had different levels of consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And that's see, that's exactly like, man, I love that analogy because that's exactly it. Like there's so many if you will, empowerment movements, like empowering women, but they're empowering them to, just to use your analogy, to see black and white. Right. They're to see more black or to see more white. And it's not about that. It's You need to be empowered to understand that there is no such thing as color. Yep. So, yeah. Thank you for, for that example. I'm going to have to use that one more often now. You're welcome. It's wonderful. Okay, two more questions. Number one, what is the key to your success in all of this? Um, I don't, I don't really know, but <laughs> I think truth be told is getting outside of myself and realizing it's not about me. Okay. It's about this gift that, that I can serve these women and help them see clearly beyond themselves, like get them out of their head and, and the lack of confidence and understand that again, it's not about black and white. It's about the consciousness, if you will. Um, so it's about, I think, for me, my greatest gift is that I'm able to serve. Like, I don't know. I think just putting myself in that ability, the position. I love that. I agree. When you, when you disappear and time disappears and nothing else matters, all of a sudden you, you fall in love with the moment. And it sounds like you certainly love what you do, which means... Yeah. You, you would disappear in that moment truly of service yeah. to others and helping them succeed, which is such a beautiful and powerful place to come from. It's so true. Like, I know you live this too, because I, I see your live streams and I see your, your Instagram posts. Like, it's not about you. Yeah. It's really not about you. It's about helping others. And being in that position is just, it's just so exciting to wake up and be like, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go out there and just be loving every single day. That's awesome. Our final question, what is one actionable tip that can help others achieve and experience the kind of success in their life that you've been able to create in yours? Okay, can you run that by me one more time? <laughs> what is one actionable tip that can help okay. others achieve and experience the kind of success in their life that you've been able to experience and create in your life? Understand that it's not about you. It's about the gift that you have for the world. I think that sums it up. I think it does. My, my, my heart is cheering for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a beautiful, it's, it's, succinct it's, truth, and it is a deep truth. But it's so true, though. Like, and, and it's funny because you know when you find people who understand that concept and that are on that same wavelength, yeah. like you, you just know. Like you I, just know. I walk like, I know of, that you know. I walk out of the room doing these interviews, and you know, my wife will laugh. Sometimes I'm in tears, and I'll come hug her, and she's like, what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm like, don't die. And she's like, oh, my God, what happened? I'm like, oh, I just interviewed a man who lost his wife, and oh, oh God, my heart. And another time, I'll just come out pissed. I'm like, she's like, what happened? And I'm like, oh, I just interviewed a guy who went on a sting operation and saved 30, 9, 10, and 12-year-old girls who had been <gasps> abducted and put into sex slavery. And he, he did a sting operation to help save them. And I'm pissed that that shit even happens in the world. And she's like, oh, I'm pissed too. And, and the other days, I'll come out of the room and, and I'll just be smiling. She's like, who did you just talk to? What and I'm did, like, what I found it? my people. 
They're out there. Yes. I know they're. I found another yes. one. They're amazing. She always starts yes. laughing. <laughs> yeah, it's like when I, whenever I help someone like get a job or land an interview, like I'll be like, Paul, this is so exciting. And he's like, what happened? I'm like, oh, she did the courses. She did exactly what I told her to do. And she landed her job. She's there. She's there. Um, but speaking of which, so part of the proceeds of um, my last book, I send them to uh, helping women and, and we like women who and, and young women who are recovering victims of sex trafficking, which it sounds like this one of these guys that you interviewed uh, does. We help them retool their careers completely for free. So if you have any kind of connections there that you want to send my way, by all means, like we're always looking to partner and help women who are coming from these kind of situations and help like help them recraft their resumes and LinkedIn profiles and help them figure out what their career path should really be. So if you have any of those stories there that you're like, hey, if these women need help, by all means, like we want to help them absolutely for free to retool themselves. Amazing. I'll send a few over. I, I just interviewed another man. Um, there was one guy who's helping with the sting operations of going and actually eradicating the, the people who are doing it, the traffickers, and, and then freeing the, wow. the young ones. Uh, there's another person I interviewed some, somewhat recently, a few episodes ago, who he has a foundation that helps house and, and rebuild the person side of, of the young people who, who've been through that. So more or less, they become the um, sanctuary or home or shelter or place that they go and stay and they educate them wow. and train them and, and try to build them. Uh, back in the you know powerful humans that they are and remind them how powerful they are and then get them ready for a job and stuff like that so it'd probably be very helpful for you guys to come oh, absolutely um, yeah we're always looking for new partners to send proceeds of our books or yeah. to help uh, help the actual women recovering because like when you're going like okay your job if you will like was being sex trafficked like when you go from there to like okay now you have to find something else and you don't have anyone to hold your hand or help you figure out what you should be doing. Like it's so easy to fall into the wrong path, if you will. And like not do things that you could like, not maximize your potential. Completely. Absolutely. I'll, I'll make sure to make that connection. Now for everyone listening, if they want to learn yeah. more about you, if they want to connect, where do we send them? Salarycoaching.com. How do we spell that? Uh, great. Spelling's not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> Salary, S-A-L-A-R-Y, huh? coaching.com. Or they can email us at ask at salarycoaching.com. And if they have any kind of questions, we can just pass them along or forward them to the right resource. Very cool. Well, it's salary, S-A-L-A-R-Y, coaching.com. Look in the yep. show notes if you're listening to this. Look on the post if you're reading this somewhere. Uh, go there. You can email them at ask at salarycoaching.com or visit the website again at salarycoaching.com. Olivia, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. No, thank you, Derek. This is awesome. This is so fun. And for everyone tuning in, if you heard something that you liked, enjoyed, something you know someone you, you know, or a colleague, a friend, a family member that needs to hear, we believe that sharing is caring. We love caring people around here, so make sure to share this with them. And we very much look forward to seeing you next episode. Thank you.